So uh, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you happen to be. I'm Rob McDonald. Um, most of you may, if you've been to one of these workshops before, you've probably seen these slides, but they're always a nice warm up to get us started and into the mood for a workshop um, and get people thinking about what OpenBSP is and what it's for. I like to think about geometry as the start of almost everything we do as engineers. Um, when you took a statics class, you probably learned uh, to start with your free body diagram. And so we're we're used to starting our engineering analysis activities with a drawing. And so really so much of engineering is fundamental to the shape of uh, whatever we are analyzing or designing. <clears throat> and that's really the truth, whether we're doing aerodynamics or manufacturing or acoustics, air elasticity, all these different disciplines. So shape is a common denominator for engineering analysis. However, in practice, uh, the, there's seldom any actual commonality. In practice, these tools, these analyses have very different needs from the geometry. And of course, since their codes and their methods and their techniques, their theory, uh, all developed separately, um, their geometry needs develop separately. And so in a workflow, when you're designing an aircraft, you'll often find that you end up needing multiple geometry models of a single aircraft. It's it's very inefficient, very redundant, and kind of a pain in the butt. Next slide. So the fact is, is that none of these things are actually, when we, when we do the analysis, none of these representations correspond to the true geometry, meaning the real true shape, if you were to go out and put your hands on it. What usually happens is, is you'll have someone build a CAD model with a single intent. You'll make a model for aerodynamics. You'll make a model for manufacturing or for you know, integration of maintenance or structures. And each of these different CAD models have different simplifications and different uh, limitations. Different decisions have been made in constructing them in order to feed their analysis tools in order to capture the intent. Um, you know, an aerodynamics model only needs the outer mold line. It doesn't need the interior bulkheads and the seats and the engines and everything on the inside of an airplane. But even on the outside of an airplane, you'll typically remove all the fasteners and a lot of seams and gaps and things that show up in manufacturing because our meshing techniques and our, our computational analysis simply doesn't have the level of detail to capture all of those things that might instead be included in a CAD model meant for manufacturing where you're going to go directly to CNC and cut parts. So we need to recognize that, you know, there isn't necessarily one true model and the, the geometry model of an airplane varies where we are in the life cycle of the aircraft from conceptual design all the way to production and even post production and support. Next slide. There's also a gap in in how we do geometry. Um, the historical way was uh that every analysis tool had its own geometry model and that geometry model was built into that tool and that model satisfied the needs for that tool and that tool alone and i've seen cases for example of an old aerodynamics code whose um source was about 500 pages of fortran about 100 pages of that was the solver a large chunk was memory management overwhelming majority was actually the geometry. And we don't even think about that as being a part of a of an aerodynamics tool, but you had to get your geometry somehow. So that's sort of the one way of doing it. A lot of tools still do that. The opposite approach really was born out of the finite element world, which is where you start with your CAD model and you use a general purpose CAD model that then you go through to a dedicated grid generation tool and through some pre-processing tools to lead into a finite element analysis. And that CAD post-based approach is very general, um, but very labor intensive and uh, requires a lot of other tools. But there's a fundamental gap between the geometry model and the analysis. And one of the main goals of OpenVSP is to try and fill this gap where, you know, we're not uh, to get people away from using the analysis integrated where there's a separate geometry model for every analysis, but also not being anywhere near as heavyweight as um, as CAD and a lot of those difficulties. So that's where we're trying to fit in. 
Next slide. So there's also lots of problems with the fidelity opportunities and, and what exists in, uh, in a design process. While there's many different levels of fidelity out there available to engineers in theory, what we find in practice is that you're usually not able to choose your level of fidelity freely. You don't get to choose it based on uh, just simply the decision that you're making at the time and what it requires, but you often end up choosing the tool based on the other tools around you. For example, um, if the only geometry model you have of an aircraft is a high tool, then it's going to be very difficult to, to develop an equivalent stick and equivalent beam model of the structures. Or likewise, if, um, if your company is invested tremendously in a particular path from geometry to mesh to solver, and you've developed tools around that, and you've developed, obviously you've invested a lot in licenses around that, you've tremendous expense in, in dollars and, and engineer time, that means that it's very difficult for you to perhaps go and use another tool that hasn't been invested in, perhaps a lower fidelity tool, a vortex lattice or a lifting line theory, something like that, that might be appropriate for the decision you're making, but that really isn't um, that really isn't an option because you haven't invested in that tool. So what we actually end up with in practice is instead of a densely populated matrix uh, from low fidelity to high fidelity across all the disciplines of an aircraft, we actually have a sparsely populated matrix where in any given discipline, we may only have invested in one tool path. And given that sparsely populated matrix, we don't have the ability to choose freely. We can only pretty much choose for each, di di each discipline, we can only choose one tool at a time. Uh, next slide. So when I'm talking about geometry, um, we have to ask ourselves, what is the real shape? And um, in OpenVSP and, and in other tools, we have many possible representations of a single geometry. In the upper right, we have a representation that's perhaps a smooth mathematical surface. We have a wireframe, we have a stack of airfoils. You might have a thin surface, what we might call a potato chip, like a vortex lattice surface. You might have a, 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 a rough triangulated surface in the center or a nice, pretty mesh generated, um, unstructured mesh on the left. You could have a finite element mesh with, with ribs and spars and finite element nodes. You could have an equivalent plate model or even an equivalent line model. And all these different representations are the kinds of things that we feed to analyses and they all represent a single geometry. And so one of the one of the core ideas of VSP is to be able to feed all of these kinds of analyses, generate all these different representations from the single concept of the model, the single geometry representation. And in VSP, we like that geometry to be represented by parameters, the engineering parameters that are intuitive, things like aspect ratio, area sweep, uh, taper ratio, thickness to cord in this wing example. And that way, those parameters become the true geometry and everything else is just a representation of that idea. Next slide. So a lot of people will make the mistake and think that um, that fidelity increases throughout the design process. And I'd like to make the argument instead that, that it doesn't. And I think we'll do that more on the, the slide after this. But right here, the representation definitely has to do with the fidelity of tool where you'll use one representation like the thin surface on the left for a vortex lattice code, maybe something in the middle, like in the middle for a panel code or all the way over to the right for a CFD tool where we have different meshes, different tools that relate to the order or the fidelity of that tool. Next slide. But that does not necessarily mean that's the process as it corresponds to the phase of design. It is not necessarily true that you always go from lower fidelity to higher fidelity as you go from conceptual to preliminary and detailed design. And examples of this, you know, if you're designing a, a transonic aircraft, you may need to consider um, some interference drag concepts that can only be captured with a high fidelity aero tool. 
And you may need to consider some of those things in the conceptual design process. And at the same time, during detail design, you may do some hand calculations when designing and calculating the loads on a rudder pulley bracket. And so there's times when you need high fidelity in, in conceptual design, and there's times when you need low fidelity in detail design. And so we shouldn't, do not make the mistake of correlating that fidelity and these tools are direct correlation to the phase of the design process. Next slide. Instead, what you should think about is what design phase you're in, whether it's conceptual, preliminary, or detailed design, is not about how the decisions are made, right? It's not about the fidelity used to make the decision and to inform it. Instead, it's about what decisions are made. During conceptual design, you're making these bulk, big bone decisions, you know, primary wing layout, uh, what are the mission requirements? How are you gonna achieve this? In preliminary design, you're nuancing things a bit more. You're, you're deciding exactly the structural layout. Uh, you're nuancing the twist of the wing and maybe the camber of the wing. All the way to detail design, you're, you're lining up rivet holes. You're doing composite ply layouts. You're designing tooling, manufacturability. So you're making fundamentally different decisions in these processes. That's what changes through the design phase, not fidelity. Fidelity is an independent axis to this process. And obviously in VSP, we're focused on conceptual and somewhat into preliminary design, but we're also focused on letting you have all of the different fidelity tools that you need to make the decisions that you're making. Next slide. So OpenVSP is a parametric tool, and we come from a place where those parameters are the geometry truth, right? They are the ground truth. That's really where we start. And so the, the, sh the concept, that idea, this is a wing, this is a NACA four digit airfoil, you know, the aspect ratio is eight, right? Those ideas, that is the geometry. And everything else is a representation. And, you know, parameters work throughout this process. In the conceptual design process, we have these bulk parameters, things like aspect ratio area and taper ratio of a wing. In preliminary design, we add some more detail. We have twist as a function of span and thickness to cord as a function of span. Our, our wing plan form gets more complex. We're nuancing high lift. You know, there's a lot more parameters, but they're still parametric. When we go to detail design, uh, every part needs every detail laid out. And the the idea, the same process of using parameterizations starts to fall apart because we can't really limit ourselves to the families of shapes. We instead need more general shapes that CAD lets us do. And so while there's still parameters there, it's a little bit less intuitive for parametric. So that's part of why OpenBSP is really best suited to conceptual and into preliminary design. Next slide. Um, so hopefully, uh, this this if this is your first workshop, welcome. Uh, if you've been to some before, we're, we're great to have you back. We are doing things a little bit differently this year. In the, this year's virtual workshop, we're going to try and avoid a lot of repetition from what was available in last year's workshop. And that's because last year's presentations are still available on video. And so this year, we're going to try and purposely avoid uh, a lot of repetition. And so we'll be doing new things and updates, although some of it will be repeated from past workshops. Um, and normally at this point, I do a show of hands in the audience to see who's who's been at every workshop or, or how many you've been to, but uh, we'll just do a virtual show of hands. You guys can um, think about how many of these you've been to or if you've missed. And the other thing I'd like everyone to look at here is the current version of, of OpenBSP is 3.25. Um, Think about where you are, right? Are you still using version 3.15? Um, are you using something else uh, pretty old? And it's time to update if you haven't. There's there's no good reason not to. Uh, in general, there's a lot of progress that's made and a lot of changes made every version. So if you are using an ancient version, it's it's time to bring yourself up to, uh, to the current day and to just try and stay there where we can best uh, fix problems and help support everyone. Next slide. So here's a short list of some of the things that have been added since the last workshop. 
Um, one of the big changes was support for faster updates. And this one has been a bit painful. It's caused a lot of bugs, but I hope we've got most of them resolved. And I hope that everyone is seeing a much faster, more interactive process with OpenBSB and, and complicated models. Uh, negative volume support's been added to MeshGeom and a lot of the other uh, computational the solid geometry, the, the constructive solid geometry CSG tools that we have. Um, we're developing a, a hybrid thick thin surface representation. I'll show some of that later in the workshop. Uh, some user interface things, re resizable columns so that a lot of table outputs uh, in the GUI are a lot easier to use and better show information. Enhanced airflow types, enhancements to actuator disk, um, you know, enhancements to FEA, really things across the board. Um, a lot of improvements to the API, the API documentation and the documentation tests. Uh, big updates to the VSPRO solver, the viewer and slicer that go together. Dave Kinney will be talking about that in a moment. And support to that matching in the GUI. And um, just across the board, a lot of inputs, a lot of fixes and bug fixes. So lots of good reasons to stay up to date. Next slide. And I think that's all that we've got for this introduction. Um, we've got some room here for questions in either the the conference IO or over on YouTube. And um, we're not going to, if we finish this presentation early, we're not going to just dive straight into the next one. We're going to try and stay on the on the schedule throughout this three day workshop. That way, if anybody is uh, timing their arrival so that they can they can capture a particular presentation, uh, we won't lose that person. So. We've got a couple of minutes here for, for any questions that uh, Brandon or I are happy to take. All right, thanks very much, Rob. I appreciate the overview. Um, so right now I am uh, presenting on, I've got my microphone going and desktop audio. So if anybody's catching any feedback on the live stream, let me know and uh, I'll get that sorted about as quick as I can. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this slideshow. So, yep, should bring that back up. Great. I'm going to stop presenting that and uh, pop this on for just a second. So, hopefully, everybody can still see what's going on. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, some questions here popping up in the conferences I/O. Um, one of which is, can OpenVSP model flow and downdraft interactions for EV toll aircraft? That's probably one that we'll pose to uh, to Dave here in a little while. And I'll, uh, I'll, take, a, I'll take a quick take a stab, stab, and Dave can certainly okay. address it more. Um, I, I'd say you could give it a try. I know that it has been used, VSP Aero has been used to model um, aircraft and a propeller inside a wind tunnel. And it's also been used to model a propeller uh, on a ground test stand where there was a building and a, and a cinder block wall nearby. And so they were able to build models of those walls and then put the propeller in and look at uh, how the performance on the propeller changed with, with those walls in proximity. So I know that that's been done. Um, I think it depends a lot on exactly what you want to get out of an analysis like that. And um, I suspect you might want to do prescribed motion where you model the aircraft flying, say, through an urban canyon or approaching uh, a building. And there's there's some support for unsteady analysis with prescribed motion, but that level of complex motion would be would be very difficult to achieve right now. Um, so maybe Dave will have some answers for that down the road and ways to do that in the future. Um, I'd, and then there's also a question here. If anybody on YouTube is not on the I.O. site, you should join us there. Um, but a question about control surface and high lift modeling capabilities and anything with a gap, right? Anything leading edge slots or slotted flaps for Fowler is, is difficult to do in VSP. Um, and I, I think that basically the answer I have there is I have some ideas for how to do that. Um, but but large challenging uh, tool development like that uh, needs to be frankly has historically in VSB has been financially supported by a sponsor who's interested in that particular kind of work and so you know historically that's usually the Air Force or NASA um, 
And, you know, we're working on whatever priorities there have been there. When I was working at Uber, I was obviously able to work on things that uh, Uber prioritized. But um, so I would say that it's certainly possible. I have some ideas on how to approach that, but it's probably not going to happen. It would be a, it'd be a lot of work. And it, so it's probably not going to happen without uh, the, the support of a sponsor who's interested in that particular work.